Welcome to Unrestricted, the show where we hear from incredible women who live life on their own terms, who take care of their mind, body, and soul while building successful businesses and projects they love. I'm your host, Athena Simpson. I'm a serial entrepreneur and life and business optimization coach and educator who helps women uncover their superpowers so they can thrive at life and work without compromise. I went from being deeply depressed, self-loathing and unhealthy to living an exciting and fulfilling life, running a business that I love. I feel stronger, healthier, and happier than I ever have before. It took a lot of work and exploration to get to this point, and I'm still learning every day. Every week, I'll be introducing you to a woman who went on an incredible journey to discover what would make her happy and the subsequent business or project that lights up her soul. I want you to have an unfiltered view into the reality of transformation with clear, tangible takeaways that you can apply to your life and career or business to help you get more unrestricted. So put your phone into do not disturb, minimize any distractions, and let's dive into today's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Unrestricted Live. On today's episode, I'm going to introduce you to Ali Kavosi, a sex tantra and relationship coach who's one of my favorite finds here in Tulum. You'll hear about her incredible journey where although she decided she wanted to leave her job, it took her almost four years to take the leap and leave her six-figure income to go travel the world. She experienced heartbreak and setbacks that most people would give up after experiencing, but with her natural ability for entrepreneurship, she turned her catastrophes into gold, and she just hit her first six-figure year since leaving behind the corporate life. Today, we'll be chatting about listening to your intuition, how to prepare for leaving your job and traveling the world, being creative with side businesses while you figure out what your true calling is, how to get over burnout tendencies and enjoy the ride, and most importantly, how to find love. So strap in, this one is going to inspire you to follow your dreams and your heart. Hello and welcome to Unrestricted. I am so, so excited for today's guest. This is a dear friend of mine and an absolute powerhouse that is changing the game in Saloon. Please welcome Allie. Hi guys, how are you? Hey, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. So let's dive right in. Tell us who you are, what you do, and where are you? <sighs> yes. Okay. So my name is Ali Kamosi. I am currently living in Tulum, Mexico. And yeah, super stoked to be here and having this conversation and getting to catch up today. I am a sex tantra and relationships coach. I also run a women's group called the Tulum Girl Gang. We have 5,400 plus women in the last year and growing where we just support lots of women who are, you know, outside of their home country, who want to create community, who want to support each other, who want to redefine the way women come together and support each other. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And for those of you that know, I'm living in Tulum and one of the first places that I stopped was the Tulum Girl Gang and I met Ali and I'm so, so grateful I have this woman in my life and you're going to find out why. So Let's get the backstory first. I've been filming this with a lot of women and, and we all have pretty crazy backstories and painful ones and, you know, this rising through the ashes. So I want to get the full experience. So tell me <laughs> the last time you were working for someone else, what were you doing and, and how are you feeling? Yeah. So, okay. I grew up in a small town, upstate New York. And after I um, went to college, I decided it was time for me to move. I was going to go explore. And I ended up in New York City, which was three hours away. It felt good because it wasn't too far. It was, you know, safer than going somewhere further. And I got right into corporate. It was the second job I applied for. I got the job at ADP, Automatic Data Processing, doing human capital management sales. Sounds sexy, right? (laughs) Not... But I, you know, had been conditioned to go to school, you get the job, then you're going to, you know, find the guy, you're going to get married, you're going to buy the house, you're going to pop out the babies. And that was the plan, because that's what I was told you're supposed to do. So I went to corporate, mind you, I was really scared. I had lost my mom when I was 18, my first week of college, my mom passed away. And I remember I had some family members being like, she's in trouble. She's going to struggle. She's going to make it through college. I hadn't been that great in high school. I was a smart kid in high school. And so when I went to college, I was like, oh, screw you people. I'm going to show you and I'm going to make it. 
And because my mom was gone, it was that security blanket, that financial security blanket, that comfort security blanket that was gone. And while I had a really supportive family, they loved me. I know that they would have been there to catch me had I fallen. I didn't feel that way. That wasn't the the idea that I, that I'd had, right. I was like, I'm on my own. I got to figure this out. So I went to corporate and I worked my ass off my first year. I was working seven in the morning to eight at night. I was just a workhorse. And it paid off. I ended up doing really well. I was making six figures by 24, a year and a half into the job. And I did sales for six years at that company. And I went through a lot of highs and lows because sometimes I was doing great. Sometimes I was like, I'm sick of this. Something's missing. It just doesn't feel like this is it. Mm-hmm. And so finally I read a book. I started getting into spirituality and meditation and the spiritual world. And everyone was basically saying and telling me, don't go there. It's weird. Um, but I was intrigued. And I then did a business development book and I read the four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And this book changed my life. It flipped me upside down. It basically said there's people out in the world who are going and working for almost no hours a week while I'm working 60 hours a week. And then they, instead of retiring at 60, they retire at 30 and they have their money working for them. And I was just like, whoa. I want that. Why am I waiting till 60? I'm going to be old. Who knows if I'm even going to be here? Why am I waiting? So I said, okay, let me think about this. It took me four years to actually leave my job. Four years from reading that book. I was so scared. After the second year, two years from reading that book, I made a decision. It was a Thursday morning. I will never forget. This was the weirdest thing. I made the decision. I'm quitting. I'm quitting my job. It was the first time I said it out loud. I was like, I'm moving to Bali. I had seven tabs open. One-way flights to Bali, Airbnb in Bali, how to get a visa, all the questions. I click over into my Outlook inbox so my job. And there was an email at the top. 11 months prior, I had applied to a job for corporate sales training. I wanted to be a trainer. It's the one job I wanted at ADP. Everything else I was bored and done. And I was like, that's weird. So weird. Of course, the second I declare I'm leaving, this email comes in my inbox. So I was like, all right, let me just apply for this. There's a reason this is happening. I trust signs and stuff. So if I get the job, I stay. If I don't get the job, I'm leaving. And then I got the job. (laughs) So I stayed another 18 months. Yeah. Really glad I stayed because that basically was the springboard into what I do now because I was motivating, I was supporting, I was coaching, I was the hype man. I was like getting people to drink the ADP Kool-Aid as they joined the company on the America's division. So anybody who joined small business sales in all of the United States, I taught, I was training 1200 people a year. So yeah, finally I had had a breakup. I went to Burning Man, which is this festival out in the middle of the desert. I met this very fun German man. I had this romantic fling with a few months later, I went to go visit him. He dumped me a week before I was supposed to fly to Germany. I was heartbroken. (laughs) Yeah, it was a great time. We had a good time. But after I was like, I just need to make some changes. And that was after that trip. Thank God he dumped me. Thank God all of that happened. I made the declaration. I'm leaving. Six months later, I'd done all the prep work. I quit my job. And that was in 2018. Okay. So I was doing the math. So four hour work week, and then it was four years in total, or it was four years, then 18 months, then another six months. So I read the book and then four years later, I quit my job. And then in between there, I gotten the new job. So four hour work week, two years later, I got the new job as a corporate sales trainer. 18 months later, I quit I for good. And I, I love this six month plan because this is what I talk to people about. There's the emotional quit, which often means that you have to go back to work for someone else. And there's a strategic quit. So tell me what that six month process looked like for deciding, okay, I'm really doing it this time. And you took six months to, to plan it. What did that look like? What were you doing? Yeah, I first made the declaration. Step one was to figure out how is I going to manage this with my job? Because I did do a process where I was like, can I do a work remotely? Can I Mm -hmm. do a different job? So I went through a a four-step process of pitching different things to my job. The last thing that I ended up pitching because they're like, you can't work remote. You can't take another job. A lot of no's, all the no's. But then I was like, can I quit? And then if I want to come back in three months, I can maybe try to come back. And they were like, yes, we can do that. So I negotiated potentially coming back after three months. And this was my safety blanket. It's scary to leave your job, mm-hmm. especially when it's, it's your income, it's your livelihood, it's your whole life you're quitting, essentially. I also made it a point to reach out to women who I knew were doing this type of stuff. 
I mm-hmm. reached out to two specific women and I asked them every question under the sun. What do you do about healthcare? What do you do about your phone bill? How do you manage homesickness? How do you decide how long you're going to stay in a country for all of this stuff? Cause I was going to go backpacking first before I was going to go into the entrepreneur stuff. So how do you make money? What are different challenges you've had? I had a whole Excel spreadsheet of different questions that I asked them. I would go through this huge list of questions, asking these women who are already out doing what I wanted to do to prepare. That is how I felt more safe by finding out from somebody else who was doing it. And so many women are open to having these conversations. It's just having the courage to ask. Most likely they'll say yes. Here I am three years later, this process that I went through from Before I quit all the way through now making money, I wrote a book about. So if you guys are interested, it's called The Inside Out Traveler. Definitely send me a message. It's on pre-sale right now. Happy to support anybody who's in this process of finally wanting to make the leap and uh, feel supported in that process. So, yes, I love that. First of all, I just love how your brain works. This is why we're friends. (laughs) Like I'm going to make a plan and get a spreadsheet and go to other women that are doing what I want to be doing and ask all the questions. And the other thing that you mentioned too, that I, I don't want to glaze over because it's, it's a common theme and something that I want women to know is available to them is if you are great at your job, they don't want you to go. You can negotiate things that work for you, right? So you can negotiate being a freelancer for them and maybe just doing the work that you want to do for them on your own terms. Or like Ali did saying, okay, I might come back in three months and it gives you a little bit of safety net. So you're like, okay, I feel a little bit safer to go and do this thing. But often we don't speak up or don't even think that that's available and you're leaving anyway. So you might as well practice having difficult conversations, practice asking for things that you want and seeing whether you get it. The worst thing is they're just going to say, no, you're already leaving. So first of all, I love that you had a four-step process to try to go through that. And then the other thing is, I think these questions that we have often frees us from taking action. And I love questions because you can find answers to them. You can Google, you can have conversations and just that. And you don't have to take any action getting this information, doing this information collecting, right? A lot of us freeze in the conversations that are in our head rather than saying, well, I can take action by just finding out information. It doesn't mean that I have to quit. And I love that you wrote a book about this. Check out Ellie's book. That's amazing. So you made the decision, you planned for it. You talked to other women. What was the quit like, first of all? Because I love hearing these moments. What was the actual quit like? And then what did you do after you quit? So leading up to the quit, I was freaking scared. I, I was. Right before I declared it, I was really scared. And then there was one thought that has pushed me and it's helped me so much through my life. And it's that it will always be there. There will always be a job to be had. The hometown you lived in will always be there that you can go back to. The friends that you have will always still be there if they're real, true friends. When I left upstate New York to go down to New York City, that was the thing I said. Upstate will always be here. And the other piece to that is that with New York City, for example, like 4 million people live down in just Manhattan alone. They're all doing it. They can do it. So can I. It's the same thing with traveling. I'm like, there's all these digital nomads. There's all these backpackers. There's all these people doing it. If they can do it, so can I. And that gave me the courage to take the leap. Pre-declaration, I was super sad, depressed, kind of a little bit because I had my heart broken. As soon as I made that declaration, I was so excited and I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was like heaven. And then I remember the day it was time to quit. It was very nostalgic, leaving a company that I had been with for eight years, a company that I thought that I would have maybe been a for lifer. We call them the lifers. I thought that was going to maybe be me. So to be leaving that and going on a limb here and trying something completely new, I was stoked. But I'll never forget the plane ride. My first stop was to Ibiza, which you can see now in wellness, yoga, and spirituality. My life has completely changed. I remember being on the plane being like, God, I really hope this plane doesn't crash. This would be really shitty timing (laughs) because I just like made this life decision. So I was really happy when the plane landed (laughs) and I was on my adventure. Yeah. So anyway, so it felt really good to quit. It felt really relieving. Three months passed. I was like, I'm not going back. I need three more months. The six months were there and I was like, I don't want to go back. I just don't want to. When I originally quit, I went from making six figures plus I was making really good money to making less than a thousand dollars a month. My first six months of travel and that I was okay with. I swallowed the pill, but I am entrepreneurial. I love the art of business. I love creating. I love entrepreneurship. And so I knew that it was time for me to start figuring out how I wanted to start manifesting my next chapter in terms of making it uh, financially 
secure and possible. Mm -hmm. So what were you doing during that six months? How were you making a thousand a month? Was that through yoga? No, I wasn't even a yoga teacher then. I was basically renting my apartment. I had the long-term guest at my apartment. So that was a little bit of income coming in. So my original strategy was just getting money coming from different places and trying a bunch of different things to see what I liked. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just trying to figure it out. How do you, if you like something, you have to try it. So I was making these little videos and just recapping my trip. I learned how to use iMovie and I got pretty good at it. So then I would start doing business deals with places I would go like hostels and hotels and restaurants and I would do trades and I would get, get paid. I would do photography and I do videography. And that led me into social media work. And then I'd done some free barters. I would barter things. And then I took on some social media clients. And then I'll never forget. It was about eight months into my trip. I was dating a guy another heartbreak situation. I got cheated on. I was supposed to be visiting him and I found out he cheated on me. So I flew to Ohio where he lived and I ended up taking a bus straight to New York. I saw him for six hours, had our final breakup conversation and I went to New York. The irony is that that exact week, the person who was long-term renting my apartment bailed. And I was like, shit, I have rent. This person bailed. Thank God. It was kind of perfect timing, but I got back to New York I was like, what am I going to do? I have a $2,000 a month apartment and I don't have money coming in. I can't afford this. And so basically in a desperate plead, I threw it on Airbnb in two weeks. I covered the rent. Wow. Which meant I quadrupled what I was earning on that apartment by having to go on Airbnb. So what seemed to be this big catastrophe ended up being the best financial blessing ever. It was just the timing of it was insane. All of it. That's, that's amazing. So I want to talk about the catastrophes, right? I think it's an important point to note that these moments happen where when they're happening, we feel like it's probably the worst thing ever. We allow ourselves to get so wrapped up in it. And having gone through so many of these catastrophes now and these royal burnups and royal fuck ups and then the lessons that come out of that every time something happens now there's a lesson in this right there's going to be some gold in this and every single shitty thing that's happened to me there is a gift in that there was a lesson in that there was a learning in that when I was listening to the how I built this podcast with Adam Grant and he was saying that he knows friends that celebrate failures because it means that they learned something. So I love that. So I just wanted to pull that out, but you have bad luck traveling to go see men that you're dating. It sounds like it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's historically my track record with men <laughs> was not the best, but the beauty in all of that is a lot of heartbreak leads to a lot of healing. A lot of heartbreak leads to a lot of lessons learned. And I take all of my lessons very seriously. That heartbreak that I experienced, the one with the Berlin guy, not that big of a deal. It was six weeks of challenge. And then it manifested into me doing this whole adventure, right? Best blessing ever. The second guy, this led me into a six month spiral where I was paralyzed in fear and sadness. I was having nightmares. He is posting, you know, 30 photos in 60 days of him and his new girlfriend traveling to Italy with his family. Oh. I was just like, for the love of God. And I couldn't stop looking. I just couldn't stop. It was bad. I was having nightmares and crying. It was just ridiculous. I needed that though. That heartbreak, that pain, that low, one of my lowest lows of my life. I was living at my dad's house for a few months. I just didn't know, did I want to travel? I couldn't feel. I was just so empty. I had to really go deep. I had to go deep into spirituality. I had to go deep into healing. And how I healed from that is now how I help other women heal some of the things that they went through. I made a declaration because I kept going back and forth with this guy. And as he came back around, I, said, I go back to you again. This is me abandoning myself. Mm -hmm. This isn't me loving myself. I'm choosing to make it look different. I'm choosing to love myself today. And that means not going back to you and moving forward. And from that day forward, there was a new me that basically emerged, a new me with more self-love, more passion for people, more forgiveness. I forgave him. I got over all of that. I stopped being a victim. I took responsibility for where I was at. And all of these are 
the most potent, powerful lessons that have supported me so much and now are supporting other women because I'm in sex contract relationship space. All of those things are now rippling out into the world. So I'm so grateful for that experience, even though while I was going through it, you would have been this poor girl. <laughs> I just <laughs> watch out for this one. She's an emotional roller coaster ready to erupt at any second. So it was great. We we all are. I think we all have to go through this. And life doesn't stop being a roller coaster. It's like, how strapped in are we for the ride? I'm excited to hear what happens next. Okay, so we went back to New York. We got the rent covered in two weeks. So we found this was an opportunity to earn some money. This is the same time you went to dad's and, and stayed there and tried to figure out what's next. You made your declaration. You rose from the ashes. And where did you go? India. I still had healing to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going back to India. So I went to India. I did another teacher training because I had done one six or eight months prior in my travels. And from there, I went to Colombia. I did more ashrams. I did sex tantra training there, more tantra teacher training there. And then that brought me through to COVID. Right before COVID hit, I was like, okay, I need to make a decision. I need to settle down. I want to plant roots. I'm ready to have community. I'm ready to have friends and be in one spot for a while. I've been moving for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. every week to every month. I never stayed in a place more than seven weeks. COVID hit. I was between Bali and Mexico. Bali shut down. And then I ended up getting this amazing opportunity at Selena Hotel, where I basically teach yoga classes and trade for a place to live. So I get my food covered and my rent covered. And I teach a handful of classes of yoga at the beach every week. And it's such a gift because you have minimal expenses, which makes it easy to save. And it allows me the time to focus on growing my business. That's where Girl Gang started. I got here. I needed girlfriends. I had been through the ringer with men. I was still in the space of, I'm starting to open up, but I'm not exactly there yet. I just need some really cool chicks in my life, inspiring women. That's when Girl Gang was, you know, born. This time in Tulum was all about connecting with other digital nomads, experiencing what's possible, trying some different avenues. I got into different events. I was doing events. I was doing a thing called Sunrise Groove, which is an ecstatic dance, doing yoga, teaching Tantra. And the Tantra was going really, really well. People were loving it. And so then I developed it into a group program. But then I ran that a couple of times and that went really well and people loved that. And I was like, how can I keep expanding this? So then I turned that into a women's group now where it's Tantra based, it's spirituality based. It's infused with that as well as how can I, you know, let go of habits that do not serve me and toxic habits, habits that are just not supportive. And how can I attract relationships that are the relationships of my dreams, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that you talked about resonated with me and, and also is something that I'm seeing in women we, we feel so trapped in like this corporate world and in this world. I noted down that you were told you weren't smart. I'm like, you're one of the smartest women that I know. This society that we were once a part of that told us that we weren't smart. I was told I was not smart when I was in school. And my mom's like, I'm taking her to get tested. I don't believe you. But it's like, mm. this world was not set up for people like us because we don't fit in. We don't follow the rules and we don't subscribe to the norms and we want to grow and develop and transform and and hustle and do things. And it's such an experience to try to fit yourself into that for so long that you're like, I just need to feel free. I need to go and travel. I need to go and just not have responsibilities or obligations or ties and just go and explore. And it was the exact same thing I went through. It was just like universe, show me the way I've never <laughs> surrendered like this before, but I was so trapped in London. I was just like, here we go, let's go. And it's that release and surrender process that is so necessary rather than jumping straight from quitting into a business unless you've been starting that business behind the scenes it is totally okay and often necessary to just give yourself a break and surrender and explore and be creative and and try different things out you were trying different things out and seeing what you liked but then something starts to happen where we feel ready to ground down again. And rather than it be an obligation, it's like, well, I'm ready to root down and really become my highest. Because if we're traveling around and stuff, we don't really have the time and space to get into something. And I just, I love that kind of just like, Wah! like the explosion and then the implosion. And it's like, okay, I'm ready. I am rebuilt. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it was. It's like, you're floating, you're flowing, you're experiencing, you're exploring. And now it's like, okay, I get to redefine this on my own terms. And there's something really special about that. Before I was like, okay, I'm doing this because I have to do this. I'm doing this because they tell me I'm, I'm supposed to do this. 
but I wasn't listening to myself. Is this what I want? Does this feel good? Does this heal aligned based on myself and my beliefs? So to redefine that, while it can be very overwhelming because it is not easy running your own business. People look at our Instagrams, for example, and they see the travel photos and, you know, playful ocean pictures. And yes, that is all true. And that is all there, but it's a piece of it. There's also a lot of challenges, a lot of hard 12 hour days behind the scene that also come in, involved with that. I joke sometimes. I was like, yeah, I'm going to quit my nine to five so that I could go work six to six again. <laughs> so here I am again, working. But again, the difference is no one's telling me I have to. There's no boss leaning over my shoulder being like, okay, how much did you produce this month? Right. Mm-hmm. So one of my biggest focuses, old habits die hard. I'm a go-getter. I'm going to work hard. I like to put my head down. I like to be successful. My biggest shift in this go around is letting go of the end result by finding balance in the journey. Instead of needing to have success in 12 months and really working my ass off and not coming up for air. I'd rather have it in three years and take my time and do fun things and be with my friends and explore different experiences, hang out with my partner more and just enjoy the nature and the joys of Tulum or wherever else I land, you know? I just got chills, girl, and had to close my eyes and take that in. I think you articulated the feeling that I certainly have, and I'm trying to, you know, impart on women is this old school success is burning yourself out and working yourself to death. We take ourselves under, if we take those habits from that old life into our business and we don't enjoy the journey, then it just still ends up being imprisoning. We create our own reality. I see so many women just fucking give all of themselves to their business. And what they don't see is that over the the course of time, Those burnouts, those drags, the not having the clarity or making business decisions because you're tired or you're anxious or you're burnout or you're overwhelmed, the impact that it has on the long term, right? As opposed to what you just said, I would rather take three years to get to where I want to get to and enjoy this life. We left that lifestyle because we wanted to create this beautiful lifestyle for ourselves, really allowing yourself the permission to enjoy the journey and that success can also be enjoying your life. And actually, I think success, if we're going to create a new measure of success, it must be enjoying your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the one piece of advice I would give to anybody venturing out into this world. It's so easy to beat ourselves up and put so much pressure on ourselves. And I'll tell you, I fell into that not that long ago. And I've done it a couple of times in this whole process. And every Mm -hmm. time I neglect myself, I neglect my self-care, I I neglect my relationships, it bites me in the butt. And it ends up being a very big challenge. I just went through this very recently, right before I left for Burning Man in September, I literally was neglecting my relationship with my partner. I was seeing him minimally. I was neglecting my self-care. I was so focused on just results, results, results. I left for Burning Man. I came back and I've been really good since, and it's, it's reshaping my experience in my life. I'm really committed to having it look different. I'm really committed to the balance and I'm really committed to honoring the journey enjoying the journey, loving the journey, having fun on the journey while Mm -hmm. building my empire. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I love that. So back to the empire, Ali has not done herself justice here. Since I got here, what this woman has done for Tulum, what she's been able to get off the ground in Tulum, all the different things that she's had her fingers in and still having time to do the self-growth and always has a smile on her face, always there to be supportive. When I got to Tulum, I had been trapped at my parents' house for six months. I had the idea of Unrestricted in this project, and I'd launched the first group program online. No one signed up for it. So I was coming to Tulum with like my tail between my legs. I was just like, I don't know if I made the right decision. I don't know if I could do this. What the fuck? And I went to Girl Gang and just the power of connecting with other women. And Ali has done an amazing job of creating a space where this isn't about competition. This is about us supporting each other, empowering each other, bigging each other up. And I really wish that this was just standard all over the world, but it's not. We're pitted against each other. We're put in competitive environments. We think we need to compete with each other. And, and you had some bad experiences with that. And 
that's part of why you're so passionate about creating this community here. I don't know if you want to speak to any of that, but I think it's important for women that aren't in Tulum to think about how they can be creating these spaces for each other too. Yeah, totally. So when I was younger, I really struggled with sisterhood wounds and I'll still tell you it's not a hundred percent perfect, but there's been so much growth. When I was a, a young girl, I got bullied in fifth and sixth grade. They called me big, Butt. they called me Oreo, my entire group of girlfriends, they abandoned me. They called me fro because of my fluffy hair, which I love, but hated for a very long time because of that experience. And so there was some periods in high school and throughout just school where even in the workplace, one time at ADP where I just, I had really bad experiences with groups of women. So if you actually told me I would have been running a, a women's group with almost 6,000 women and I would have told you you're out of your mind because I was terrified of large <laughs> groups of women. And we've all experienced that. What happens though, is that, you know, people say stuff, they do stuff, they make fun of you, they pick on you, whatever, they bully you only because of what's happening inside of themselves. Mm -hmm. And once I started learning that, that it's really just coming from them wanting to be seen, them wanting to feel good enough, them wanting to feel loved, that made it so much easier to lean in. The other piece that was really helpful is having that common intention. And while it's not perfect, I think we do a really, really good job in our community space where it's like, hey, Coming in here means, or leaving our judgments at the door, it means that we are supporting each other. It's, we're looking to look out for each other. We're looking to expand together. Those intentions are powerful because it brings awareness to the fact that it isn't always like that or it hasn't always been like that historically. The competition stuff is crazy. My whole life, I've been taught to be competitive, whether it be sports or school or looks, wanting to be more attractive. When in reality, it's like you being successful doesn't impact my level of success. Actually, if we are supporting each other, your level of success will help my level of success and my level of success will help yours because we can share what we're learning and how we're getting there. And, and that's like getting to skip a couple rings on the ladder. Powerful. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I, I wrote down big butt. I was actually called bubble butt school, but the joke's on them. Butts came in style. Thank you, Beyonce. Oh my God. I was bullied so hard when I was a kid. And, and then it, I just ended up going into this whole, fuck you, I'm going to shave my head. Blah. And, and I had my sisterhood awakening. I've told you about it. My first women's circle. And I was like, I'm not like other women. And then they went around and shared their experience of being a woman. And I was like, I'm like every single one of you. It's this thing that we have denied ourselves or haven't been taught that is available to us. And, and I can see why, because we're powerful as fuck when we unite, when we support each other and this community and pretty much every woman that comes to Tulum ends up coming through girl gang. And it's like, this is the message they are given. You're not in competition. We're here to support each other. This is sisterhood. We're championing each other. And there's no cattiness. There's no drama. We're all going to each other's things. We're promoting each other's things. And you can get businesses or projects off the ground so quick when you have that. And we are able to talk about business and share all these things that we're doing. And those of you listening, like, oh, okay, whatever, that's into the loom. Wherever you are, I can tell you, you are probably feeling right now, I don't want to be in competition with women. And there's an amazing thing that happens when you start realizing catching yourself in that moment. Why am I criticizing this woman? And I realized that when, when I was in London, one of the epiphanies that I had was like, this woman was scantily clad. I was like, what is she wearing? And I was like, hold up. I want to be wearing what she's wearing. I want to dress however the fuck I want. It has nothing to do with her. It was my own anger at feeling caged or trapped or not able to be and express myself. Right. So yeah, I'm so, so grateful for what you've built because it's so nourishing to be in a community of women that really trust each other and support each other and have fun with each other. We dance, we go to the beach and it's amazing to feel that support, especially when a lot of us are working through the love stuff and the relationship stuff. And that's what I want to kind of touch on is your work. And, and at some point I'll, I'm sure I'll share my own personal story with your, your coaching <laughs> throughout this journey as well. Cause I've been on my own journey with my love and relationship stuff. So, so you started girl gang, you actually ran some really amazing events here where people could work on mindset. You brought together amazing speakers together and did these events, the sunrise groove, which was so much fun. It was an ecstatic dance, which for people that don't know is, is basically a dance event where there's, there's no substances. There's no talking on the dance floor. It's just about everybody expressing themselves and feeling free and flowy to be able to do that. And you arranged this on the beach at sunrise. It was incredible. And 
you just shared something with me in terms of where you got to this year with your earnings. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. We can dive into how you actually did that. Yeah. So it, I took an interesting direction. I have a lot of different resources, a lot of different ways that I earn and make money, whether it be through events or through social media, through coaching. I partner with different people on different little projects here and there that have all been part of my earnings this year. My goal though, this last three to five months has been to consolidate. So I put my energy in a lot of different places and that has proved to be successful. It's proved to work, but I decided if I were to take all of my energy and instead of dividing it into a bunch of different things to just put it into one thing that I really love now that I know what I really want to do, what would be possible? And so that's the transition I've been making. So I went from six figures to no figures (laughs) to rebuilding those figures And then back to releasing a lot of those so that I could just focus on fun now that I know that I really just want to be in the coaching space. And so that has been a, an interesting release. It can be challenging at times. My, I was talking about this with my partner last night. He's got so many great things going on and he's doing all of these different things. And and I'm used to that. And it's exciting. And it's these little hits and these little highs. And I'm like, I have to remind myself, I'm choosing to not do that right now. (laughs) I'm choosing to just focus on one thing. It's a little bit more quiet, but I'm building a foundation and you have to have a strong foundation to build a really beautiful house. And it's been a great year. It's financially, I just realized today I was going through my finances between the different things I've explored and put my energy into and my attention into all these different little avenues. I was like, oh man, Athena's podcast is for women who've made six figures and haven't technically made six figures. I was feeling a little guilt about it. And then I went to go do some financial planning and looking at all the stuff. And I had one of my stocks blast through the roof making it that I did actually make six figures this year. So I'm like, all right, for the win, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah! Wow, ah, I love this. I love it. I love it. And, and you shared this with me before and I'm so fucking fired up about it because money is something that we don't talk about enough. We don't celebrate it. So I'm super excited that I get to celebrate this with you and that you shared it and that you achieved this and, and you didn't even realize it, right? This was just kind of this effortless flow where you were trying out different things and it's okay to throw shit at the wall and see what sticks while we're figuring out what is my soul aligned purpose. And this is the dance that we do. We put so much pressure on ourselves to figure out the business. And it's like, if it's not that thing that this is going to get me out of bed, no matter fucking what, and I'm ready to put roots down and focus all my energy on that thing. But however, we can also be afraid to put all our energy into something. It's like, what if I fail? Those, those demons come up. It's like, if I commit to this one thing, then it might not work out. And you and I are both recovering perfectionists and high performers, right? So it's like, it's super scary. And I did the same thing when I got to Tulum. I was like, my, my wings were clipped. My first program didn't sell anything. Like, and now I totally clearly see why that happened. But at the time I was just like, oh my God. So I was like, let me try events again. I'm going to, I'm going to create this crazy experiential Thanksgiving experience in the jungle. And I'm going to look at doing food consulting again. And I've been picking up like consulting projects while building my business. And it's like some things we just need the financial stability and it's great. Some things it's just like, am I going to like this? Oh no, I fucking hated that. I don't want to do that. This is taking way too much energy for like what I get back. We get data from going through this process. We had a conversation the other day about the side hustle. If you have side hustles, you're very aware of how much energy and time it takes you and what the ROI is on it. And I love that. So I think we can still dance around with different income streams. As long as our main big focus, once we lock in on that, it's like, Am I not locking in on this because I'm afraid of it not working out or because it's not aligned with my soul? So tell me, was it a lightning bolt moment? How did you know that what you're doing now was the thing? So really great question. I do want to just touch on what you just said first, really quick. The idea of detaching from the things that don't have a strong ROI. I learned that from Athena. She's been teaching me this months and months and months and months ago, didn't want to let go of all of the things I was doing. 
And so now I'm very strategic. So there are little things that I still do while I focus on this, but it's stuff that I know isn't going to take me a lot of time. I try to keep it as passive income as possible. Oh my God, I just relate so much. Last year I did a day of the dead dinner and I made a thousand bucks. It was so easy, but I'm like, okay, it still took time. I still have to be there for seven hours plus organizing all that stuff. That actually isn't a good return of my investment. And it's a one-time thing. It's not building on anything. It's not compounding, not doing it. So it's really just being very clear on how much time is this going to take? Is it going to be worth my time? Is this compounding or not? It's just a one-time hit to see if it's something you want to maintain while you're focusing on your thing. Now, moving on to your question around how I figured this out, it, it was a lot of trial and error. And I'm still critiquing it to really fine tune it because again, recovering perfectionist over here. But it stemmed from when I was a corporate trainer. I loved the coaching part. I loved the training part. I loved teaching people. I loved being in front of a room. It lights me up. It fills me with excitement. And I hated them telling me I had to be there five days a week. And I hated that I was teaching things like payroll and benefits in HR. So boring. So I knew I wanted to teach. Then I got into yoga. I was teaching yoga. I knew I liked teaching yoga, but I wanted it to be more. I didn't want to just be an exercise teacher. I still love teaching yoga, but I wanted it to be more. Then I started teaching sex tantra classes. I was like, okay, this is fun. Then I remembered a little tidbit about myself, which is that since I was a kid, I've always loved talking about relationships and connection and intimacy and experiences. This has always been my favorite topic since I was a kid. From when I was a 20 year old boy, crazy girl who would love to go to the clubs. I was never the girl that would go home with you. I was totally a tease and I love to just flirt I'm still that way to this day. <laughs> Up till now, where it's now my profession, where I get to support women in working through some of these challenges that they have in dating and relationships and intimacy, it just clicked. And the other thing that was a, a helpful moment for me was when I reflected on what direction do I want to go? So I broke up with that guy I told you that cheated on me and we went back and forth. It was this very dramatic thing. Then I decided I was like choosing myself, right? I'm done going back because I love myself. I don't want to go back. The new girl that he had cheated on me with, that was his current girlfriend, he kept reaching out to me behind her back. And finally, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm really done with this. And I don't like that this is happening to this girl either. So I ended up reaching out to that girl. And I told her what had happened. And they ended up breaking up. I coached her for free just because. And I shared with her all of the tools I had learned and used through my breakup process to support her in healing and moving on. And then she ended up moving on and going into another relationship and finding her way. I just did that just because and I wanted to support and I wanted to help. It just naturally did it. And I would do it for a lot of people. I would do this for free. So that's a big, big clue. Ali is really gifted at this stuff. And I'm not just saying this because she's my friend. She's actually personally helped me before she decided that this was her path because as some of you may or may not know, I decided at the end of 2019 that I was gonna go celibate for a year and take a year off because I just realized that the way I was relating to men was not in alignment with this new person that I'd become giving up drinking, running off to the circus and finding out what makes me happy. I was just like, I need a hard reset. And the only thing that I knew was to go celibate. And so when I got to Tulum, it was coming towards the end of the year and Allie's group, the girl gang met in the same place that the men's group met. And then the two groups came together at the end of it. And I was terrified. I didn't even want to be around men. And I was just like, ah, and I was giving her feedback. I was like, I don't feel safe. <laughs> like There are men in the building. I don't like this. I, I totally recognize I'm a big force of energy. And, and sometimes people are intimidated about giving me feedback. And also if you saw us standing next to each other, I, I think I've got at least eight inches on you. And Allie was so embodied and powerful and loving in her encouragement to me to challenge myself, to just have conversations and to allow myself to be in that space and allow myself to be around male energy. And I felt so comfortable with that guidance. And actually I was resisting something that I needed to dance with. I needed to be around male energy and just having a conversation didn't mean anything. And actually I could learn a lot from that situation. So that was the first moment. And then I ended up having this brief, very crazy romance with a man that turned out to be a narcissist. And I was just like, that's it. Six more months. No man. I'm not speaking to them. I'm not talking to them. I'm not even going to look at them. I'm done. The alley giggles at me and she's like, Tina. You think about people in Overeaters Anonymous and 
they look at the people that are in Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, and they can just lock the tiger away, right? You could just lock it away and never look at it again. But in Overeater Anonymous, we have to learn how to take the tiger for a walk three times a day. And she's like, so what are you going to learn by just completely cutting yourself off? from men. She's like, maybe you just need to learn how to take tigers for walks and see what you like and see what you don't like. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> like, right. Maybe I should learn how to date again. Cause during this year of celibacy, I was just kind of like, no, 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 no. And then someone came into my life around the year ending and I was like, okay. And I was like, ah, oh, that was terrible. No. So this advice from her to maybe just learn how to relate to them again and take them for little walks. It doesn't mean anything, but you have to learn how to take them for a walk. You can't just lock them away. You not want to interact with men again for the rest of your life. And it's one of the most powerful things that I can remember over this journey of a year and nine months since I made that proclamation to swear off men was your advice that you've given me throughout this journey. And this was before you even really locked into what it is that you're doing. You have a gift for this and your ability to hold space and give advice. I was probably in one of the most resistant, absolutely not modes and you were able to get through to me. So I want to sing your praises. You know, you personally helped me really get into a space where I'm, I'm getting more comfortable I wasn't even comfortable being in the same room as men. So I really appreciate that about you. Thanks, Athena. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. I mean, I really do. You, you've had a profound impact on my life and also supported me in my business. So tell me more about the work you actually do now, how you got there and, and what it's looking like for you in terms of locking in on that business and maybe some of the excitement about it or the challenges that come up with like, okay, I found my purpose. Right. And actually just something I want to touch on before you get to that is the, the audit you were doing of yourself. What are my strengths? What do I love doing? What lights me up? What topic can I talk about at any point? You say it all kind of succinctly, but I imagine that was a process over the last couple of years of kind of gathering that data. Right. Yeah. Well, it's basically when I started, if I, if I think about top level, I was like, okay, what am I really good at? What do I really love? What am I really passionate about? And I kind of just went down the line. I was like, I really love photography. I really love videography, but I realized I don't want to do this. I hate editing photos. I like taking the photos. I don't want to do the other stuff. And it was like, it's not that impactful. I feel like I could do more Then I did yoga. I still do yoga and I love it. Still felt like I needed more. It was the process mm -hmm. of elimination. And it can be hard. I mean, there was some challenges. I got criticized by someone I really admired and really looked up to for a long time. And they basically told me that I was kind of a mess and that who am I to run off to Tulum, Mexico? And who am I to do all these things? It, it was like, I, I was a failure for trying all these things. And it was just the next thing. When in reality, I was just going through my process, trying different things, which is the process I believe in. How do you know that you don't love a Kit Kat bar unless you actually try a Kit Kat bar, right? You might you might like it. You might love it. So I got some criticism for following this process. And that was really hard to hear. And it spikes a lot of self-doubt and a lot of fear and a lot of insecurities of not being good enough. It not being possible that you're just not good enough and that no one has your back, which isn't the case. There are so many people who have my back, but it springs up all of these insecurities. And so that type of stuff can be really challenging to work through. And it's the constant reminder. That is why this self-care, the self-work is so important. And that happened a while ago and it really upset me at first. At this point, I'm like, listen, you do you, I'll do me. I trust my process. My process is my process. It's not all butterflies and rainbows and it's worth it. Hell yeah. Somebody used the description of a magnet in order to attract, we also repel. So the more we strengthen ourselves, our voice, our unique differences, what it is that we're doing, what it is that we stand for, we're going to attract a lot more people into our life. And we're also going to repel people at the same time. And if we're repelling people, it means we're doing something right because we're not just being vanilla. We're shouting out our voice, our authenticity, what it is that we believe in. And that's going to trigger people who aren't feeling confident or able to do the same. And that's a, that's a good thing because in order to attract, we must repel at the same time because Otherwise, we're just a weak magnet. We're not really stepping into our power if that's not happening. And it's something that I resonate with and, and I've had to dance with. And I mean, we talk about our businesses every time we see each other and the challenges that come up for us. And there was a big fear for me 
for a long time to even be able to post what I was doing on LinkedIn. I had this invisible audience of critics who were like, what does she think she's doing? She's so silly, la la la. <laughs> so the truth of the matter is maybe I've gotten a naysayer here or there. And if I really look at their lives and whether they're happy or not, they're not. I'm just triggering them because I'm happy and they're not. But for the most part, honest to God, the majority of the people in my life have been so supportive of what I'm doing and they've been cheering me on. And I think we can end up being our own biggest critic if we let those voices in our head, those insecurities and those bitches from back in middle school that called us big butt get in our heads. And it's about reprogramming that and tapping into what is it that I'm doing? So Tell me a little bit with the time that we have left. Tell me about the work that you're doing. Yeah. So again, I was working with men and women before. I still work with men one-on-one, but I really focused in on a women's group container where we're diving deep into four main pillars. It's first the self-work. We got to start with ourselves first. Then it's the understanding of the art of attraction. And there's tantra, sex tantra weaved into that. Then we talk about relationships, right? We go to school to learn algebra and we learn the history classes and English, which English I do think is actually really important. They don't teach us about things like communication though, and compassion and partnership skills that will support you in being in healthy relationships, things like detachment, codependency, all of these areas that they're just for whatever reason, completely neglected when these are the things that we literally are swimming in bulk of our life. So we work on those types of skills and tools and then intimacy. So understanding intimacy, understanding our bodies, connecting to that feminine energy, that fire, understanding the masculine so that we can understand our partners better. How do we have better intimacy where it's connected and conscious and communicative and loving and authentic. It's so powerful when we put intentions in this space. Love is a very overwhelming experience. It's beautiful. It's fun. It's chaotic. It's scary. It's, it's all the things you can't even use words. I feel bad even trying to to describe such a profound thing. However, I think it's important that we try to at least get a little bit closer to understanding how we can create deeper connections, how we can create better vulnerability, stronger vulnerability, more love, more compassion. And how we do one thing is how we do everything. So when we learn these skills in the relationship space, it ultimately impacts our entire life. So a deep reverence for the science of self and, you know, personal development and that growth mindset and just being our best version. When we fill ourselves up then we can serve others and that creates a ripple effect impacting the world we live in. Mm, Yes. You, you got to check out Ali's work and 100%, if you're desiring love, if you're desiring connection in your life, the work starts with you. It's not outside of you. And Ali is so good at, at holding space for that. And the work that she's doing is, is really incredible and needed work, you know, cause we're all fucking confused, <laughs> like dating and relationships. And especially when we go through our own spiritual journey, it's more confusing than ever. And I, I was doing stand-up comedy the other night and, and I was just like, once you take alcohol and you take sex off the menu, I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. I'm learning to walk all over again. And I have no clue how to get started. (laughs) It's just confusing and needed. So it's amazing that you're doing this work for those that aren't familiar with the concept of Tantra, because before I started hanging out in these communities and getting to know you, I was just like, oh, it's just sex poses. Right. And, And it's so much more than that. So please Please enlighten us into the the wonder wondrous world of Tantra. Yeah. So for those of you who get scared by the concept of sex Tantra, I promise it's really not scary. It's not a cold, not anything dangerous. So sex Tantra is about using sex, sex energy, and relationships to reach higher states of consciousness. When I say sex energy, what does that mean? You can feel energy in your body. It exists just because you can't see it. That's science, right? So you can move that energy in different ways to help heal the body. And then if you think about relationships, you look at your partner or anybody you've ever dated, they are your biggest mirror. They are a reflection of all of your challenges, all of your insecurities, all of your fears, all of the things that it brings it out for us to look at, to observe and to work with, to try to overcome and rewire. It's just the process of doing the work, 
but doing it with a partner, using your relationship as a conscious tool for development. What comes with that is increasing our skill set in the relationship space and the intimacy space to just enjoy because the over lining idea of Tantra is that everything is divine. There's divinity in everything. Life is here for us to enjoy and to savor and to experience and to see the beauty in it. And so this is a path that teaches us how to do that and how to connect more deeply with the joys of life. Mm, It's super exciting. I'm just fascinated in this whole world and how it is interconnected. As you said, what I'm realizing, the more that I work on an area, how it impacts the others. So doing the self-care and putting those habits in place to have your morning routine gives you the energy to be able to look at your relationships, working on your money stuff actually ends up, you know, making you charge more of what you're worth or doing exercise gives you the confidence to be able to go out and do a relationship. Having a really loving relationship gives you the energy to do your business or be more brave with your business or we escape to relationships to avoid the stuff that we're scared of with the business, or we allow that to be the excuse to take us away from our business. It is all interconnected. So this is really worthwhile work. So if people want to find out more about the work that you do or working with you, tell us a bit more about that, where they can find you. Yeah. So if you have any interest in learning more about sex Tantra, if you're interested in understanding why do you show up the way you show up in your relationships and how can I shift, maybe you're struggling in the dating space relationship space, intimacy space, confidence in any of those areas, loving yourself more, all of that, message me on Instagram, insideout.traveler. We can set up a call. We can chat. Happy to have a conversation. At a minimum, follow along. I post a ton of really fun, deep, sometimes heavy reels and stories and photos all about intimacy, dating, and relationships. Amazing. So I will post the Instagram handle for Ali in the show notes. It's insideout.traveler on Instagram. Her content is epic and just relationship wisdom bombs. Every single time she posts it, like, ah, you see me, you see me. So Ali, I adore you. I think you are really amazing. And thank you so much for being so candid and honest about your journey and what it took to get you to this point. I think it's going to be really helpful for women And also just want to celebrate the fact that 5,400 women have come through Tulum and you have impacted their lives positively and shown them a different way of relating with each other as well. So you're an absolute powerhouse. And before we leave, everybody that comes on the show, I like you to tell us how you would define living unrestricted. Living unrestricted to me means speaking your authentic truth. It means not being afraid of what others are going to say, following what your truth is, being okay with it being messy because again, it's not linear, but trusting your inner intuition. If your gut is saying to you, there might be more out there for me. There's something I want to try. Listen to it. It's coming up for a reason. It's speaking to you. Your gut is never wrong. That intuition, listen to it. Don't be afraid of it. Whatever you're leaving will be there if you want to go back. Trust the process. Trust in the power of the universe. You've made it this far for a reason, right? You've come this far. You've overcame all of the things you've made it through. History will prove itself again. History repeats itself. Yes, I love that. Yes, Queen. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story and your inspiration and your words. I appreciate you so much. Love you. And thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be a guest on this podcast and to just be a part of, you know, everything you're building. I am such a fan. I love everything you're creating, the way you're supporting women and stepping outside of their comfort zone to follow their intuition and follow their heart into what's, what's actually meant for them in that next chapter. So keep being the light that you are. And I'm so grateful to have you as a friend. Thank you. You're going to make me cry. Love you. (laughs) Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Unrestricted. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a minute to leave a review or give me a little shout out on Instagram at Athena.Simpson.
If you'd like more content from me on getting unrestricted, sign up for my newsletter. Well, you'll get an email from me every week with the three things that I've been devouring to optimize my life and business. It might include hacks, tips, experiments, resources, books, podcasts, and more, all to help you get more unrestricted. It's totally free and you can unsubscribe at any time. So go ahead and sign up at athenasimpson.com slash newsletter. Join me next week where we'll meet another amazing unrestricted woman to get inspired on how you can optimize your life, business, and career to thrive without compromise. I'll see you next week. Yeah.